My name is uh, Chris van Aert. I'm the technical director of uh, Bolivia. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. <clears throat> um, so my talk is about knowledge engineering with the payoff dealing with specialist knowledge. So first of all, uh, I work at a company called Bolivia. Bolivia was the first AI company in Europe, founded in 1985. And this company deals with AI, artificial intelligence, and only about with artificial intelligence. So it's not an IT company with a hobby of artificial intelligence. No, that's, that's our core. We are located in Utrecht, Netherlands. We are really proud of a lot of uh, innovation awards we received. We do a lot of R&D with diverse universities in the world. And we spend uh, a lot of time with doing AI for good, um, especially with the W, uh, uh, the World Wide Web for Greening uh, uh, Africa. So, <clears throat> uh, because for some of you it is the morning, and for some of you it is the afternoon, I would start like to start with a couple of small questions. It's a little bit of a quiz, and the task is that you just try to answer them as quick as possible. So the first question is, how much is one plus one? Write it down. How much is 12 times 34? Yes. Okay. If you look at the oh, if you look at this sequence, oh, if you look at this sequence, two, four, six, what would be the logical next sequence? Pick your choice. And this is a, a, a riddle. So there's a car accident. The father dies. The son goes to the hospital for emergency treatment. And the surgeon says, I cannot treat this patient. That is my son. So today I would like to talk about knowledge driven work and the knowledge driven work has this format. So there is a bunch of work. This can be documents or something physical or patients. The expert makes decisions and they can say it right or wrong or left or right or, or, or make a And this expert has knowledge in his head in some kind of presentation and um, can fulfill this task. And uh, well, one of the drawbacks is uh, it is slow because somebody has to do it manually. It is, it is expensive because you have to train experts. It's not standardized. If you have multiple experts, they will do it differently. And you don't know how they actually do have, have done it. So the uh, premise is if you uh, capture the knowledge of these experts and would put it in a system, you will get a, what I call it, a knowledge based system or an artificial intelligent agent. Meaning that the expert can do something else and you can uh, make this process much faster. So based on the work, you give it to the machine or the computer and the computer can make the decision, uh, which is cheaper, it's standardized because you know how the machine is doing it and it can be explained later on how that, how that works. So if you look now at the current AI approaches, so if you want to automate this, how about we investigate all the work done by the expert? So you gather a lot of data, which we now call big data. So you got a lot of data, and based on the data, the input and the output, you can look for correlations, which you can do with data science, and then you can, you can say something about, you can classify or predict the outcome of it. The other one is that you use deep learning, so that you use neural networks, which can learn from the input and the output data, uh, which can be very promising, like object character recognition, which is handwritten recognition, facial rec recognition or segmentations of images. Uh, there are a lot of labeled data sets. So if you want to do image recognition, there are a lot of training sets. But now what happens if you don't have a lot of this train of test set available or if the results are not as expected as you want? And that's where uh, knowledge engineering uh, comes in. So today I want to focus on three things. The one is what is human knowledge? The next one, if you know what human knowledge is, how can you capture it and engineer a system with it? And what are knowledge-based systems? And one of the uh, slogans is that at Belizean, we look at human tasks which are inhumanly large and how can you automate that? So le let's look at human knowledge. Um, there are a lot of uh, different ways to uh, uh, explain it, but as we, we make a distinction between uh, facts, so it means knowing that, 
or rules of thumb. So, for example, plants are poisoning, poisonous or when, when some, uh, the birthday of a person. The other one is concepts or knowing about, for example, recognizing a tree or a type of car. And the last one are procedural, knowing to do, knowing to do something or skills or heuristics, for example, riding a bike or following a recipe or repairing a car. So, uh, for example, if you want to recognize a car, so somehow we learn to recognize cars here. Uh, we see this, this object with, uh, with wheels. Uh, and one way to recognize cars is to look at the brand. So here you can see, look, I, I recognize this brand and one is a Mercedes, Toyota, and we know. And we do this because we, we have learned to, to recognize this. And actually this is called classification. So you have a couple of, uh, of different classes. You have candidates and based on specific items, you can say, look, this is this type of car. But now the car gets broken. What now, what happens? You don't know how to do it. You go to an expert, a mechanic, and this mechanic will say automatically, ah, probably out of fuel or the battery is slow. And now the, the interesting part is how did this expert know this? How, how does it work in his, uh, in his head? So one way what you could do is that you just talk about, you, you're going to talk to this expert and ask him, how did you know what the problem of the car was? And one of the first things what you can do is to create what we call a mind model. And actually this, how is the mind of the expert uh, composed? How, how does it work? In this? So you could just say, well, if I talk about a car, what are all kind of things associated with a car? And probably the expert will say, well, the first thing I will do is to look at the brand. It's a Mercedes. And I also want to know how old it is because then I know uh, when it was constructed and what are commonly uh, problems there. And mostly there's something wrong with the battery. And if that's not a problem, they have something with an engine, engine runs on fuel. If you want to start the engine, you need a fuse, et cetera, et cetera. So the guy will start a, a, a explaining how uh, how we think so how the world of cars looks like so <clears throat> what you can do then if you know all these concepts you can uh, start asking about things that can happen with all this concept or different states for example a fuse can be blown or the voltage of a battery can be low or the the fuel tank is empty or the cooling water is empty or the, the temperature of the cooling water is high so these are all kind of indications of things that can tell you that there's something wrong with the car. Uh, and if you have this information, you can formalize this, for example, in a, in a data model. So you have a car, the brand and an age, the car is an engine, which has a status, it stops running, it does not start. And an engine has a fuel tank, a battery, a fuse, or a cooling water, or cooling water. Um, if you have modeled this, you can ask them, okay, do you have a strategy to find the problem of this thing? And the expert will say, well, based on this type of car, I probably think there is no power. So the first thing you can choose is, is the fuse is blown. And the only way to do this is to uh, look at the fuse, fuse itself and see, oh, look, is it broken? If it is broken, the power is off. If the fuse is not broken, you look at the battery. Is the battery low? And you can see that from uh, the, the battery dial. If that's not a problem, you can look at whether there is uh, enough fuel. So you can look at the gas, uh, gas dial. So these are two ways to find out. These are several strategies. And this expert know this because he has experience with that. So these are like rules of thumb of heuristics. Um, and uh, what is interesting to know is uh, how we do this. And uh, uh, we, we, we people, we have two types of uh, uh, two processes in our brain. And the first one is called the fast and automatic uh, system. And the other one is the slow and effort one. And the fast and automatic is things we do automatically. So when I ask you how much is one plus one, you immediately had an answer about it. When I ask you how many is 12 minus times 34, you had to think about it. And the most challenging part about knowledge engineering is that most of the experts they operate in system one. They have so much experience with, for example, fixing cars or treating patients 
that they do a lot of things automatically. They don't even have to think about it. But we as engineers, we have to do, uh, we are operating on system two. So we have to figure out how the domain looks like, how the export is, uh, is reasoning. And we have to uh, uh, find out how an export works. So uh, one of the interesting things is to see how we actually learn. So if you want to learn arithmetic, uh, uh, you can start with what they call a, an action presentation. So you first uh, bake a cake <clears throat> and you present the cake to kids and say, look, if you divide a cake into, for example, four parts, you can eat it and you get a feeling about how that works. The next one is that you make it more <clears throat> into uh, images that you say, look, this physical thing, you can draw this and you can, for example, divide it in four things. Next, you can you go to more like a, a symbolic representation in your head. So the moment you get one divided by four, you remember the cake, you, will, you remember when you have eaten that and you know the answer about it. And that's a way how we, how we learn. And if you are going to talk with an expert, you actually want to follow all these steps in order for you to understand the domain and also for the expert to think about how the expert gained its knowledge itself. So let's go back to the questions. I ask you how many is one plus one? <clears throat> probably most of you have said, well, it's probably First, we are computer scientists and we reason in the, de in the binary because we assumed I was talking decimal, but it could be binary. The other one, how much is 12 times 34? Well, I didn't know this by heart. <clears throat> I had to, uh, to calculate it and the correct answer is 408. The other one, what's the logical sequence to 468? Well, probably you think 8. 10 or 12, but how about these were just random numbers and they just appear to be in this uh, logical sequence. And the other one, there is a car accident and the surgeon says, I cannot treat this patient, this is my son. That's because the surgeon is the mother of the son. And <clears throat> the, uh, one of the, the biggest pitfalls in, in engineering itself and in knowledge engineering is that you make assumptions about a domain you're not acquainted with. So uh, let's look how we can build system based on uh, human knowledge. So if you, uh, if you want to do that, you first have to understand the context. What's the task at hand? Next, you have to find a specialist or an expert and find out how the expert uh, thinks and reasons. So one thing is that you make a, a model of all the concepts he's talking about and that you find out how the, the expert reasons about this model. Next is that you uh, want to build a system that our advice is that you divide the ICT, so let's type databases and GUIs, with the AI. So that's a different thing. Next is that you can explain what the system has been doing, not only for testing, but also to uh, convince the expert or client that you're doing a, a well job. And you have to check all your assumptions. So how does it work? For example, we look at a mobile car diagnosis. So the context is a car gets stuck. The expert has to travel there to fix it, which is timely and uh, it's expensive. Um, the expert knowledge, the ex expert knows about a car uh, and has different diagnosis strategies. An ICT infrastructure, infrastructure could be a mobile app with a camera and a database with car models. The A architecture would be a decision model and in the end, there will be an explanation. The app has been asking questions, uh, reasons, and gives an explanation. So this could be a mock-up of the system. And you open the car or the app, and the car will say, OK, let's start the diagnosis. It will ask some questions about the car, which brand, which model, the age, and give a complaint. And the system will, well, my first hypothesis is that the fuse is blown, because we knew, knew this from, from the expert. Uh, and then you can say yes or no, and then the system will say, okay, this is, uh, uh, this is the next step. We have to find the, the problem or we have to follow another hypothesis. So in order to uh, structure this, we have a, a, a system called lean cuts. It's based on comma cuts. I will explain it later. And basically what you do is that you first figure out what the process is, how it works. You figure out how the expert thinks, um, how the expert reasons how you can put it in an infrastructure into an AI, AI infrastructure and an explain model. So for example, if you would make a, a, a mobile 
uh, car repair system, it will, it will look like this. So you start with a broken car. There's an expert which comes up with a decision. And actually you want to help this expert um, with, uh, with an app or you can uh, give apps to uh, drivers. You figure out what concepts the, uh, the expert use. You find out the reasoning model. Um, you can put this reasoning model, for example, in a decision table, which I will explain uh, later how it looks like. And that can be an explain model where you can say, look, these are all the uh, faults I observed. I have rules that say something about, for example, if a fuse is blown, that you have no power. So therefore your engine cannot be start and gives the line of, uh, of reasoning. So let's look at, uh, let's look at these two uh, concepts in detail, the mind model and the reasoning model. So if you want to uh, figure out the mind model, the first thing is that you're just going to talk to this expert like you're a five-year-old. Tell me more about why is this, why is it, why, 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 why. And the idea is, and that's my favorite part of the job, is that you just play stupid. You just say, I don't know anything about this domain. I have no assumptions at all. Just explain me what, what this is all about. And hopefully the expert will just start talking about this domain. And they will use a lot of verbs like car, fuse, and batteries. And actually what you want to do is make a distinction about concepts. And if you can put it somewhere, for example, this uh, what you see here uh, about uh, distinction between kind of animals, a duck, a fish, and a, and a zebra. Is if you can put it in a sentence like is, like a duck is an animal or a fish is an animal, it's probably a concept or a class. So you can make a, a rectangle around it. It's a concept. If you have things like has or can, so it can walk or it can swim, or it has fins or whatever, these are probably members of these classes. And with it, you can construct this mind model. Um, the next one is the reasoning part. So there has been a lot of research in what kind of reasoning uh, people uh, can do. And basically they make a distinction between two types of reasoning. So it is either analytic, so we think something about a problem, and the other is synthetic, and there we construct something new. So analytic can be a classification, for example, uh, indicate the type of car. Diagnosis is what's wrong with the car or a patient, and monitoring is, is a processing running okay. Synthetic is that you create something like a planning, in what order should I solve a problem? An assignment is uh, to whom should I assign uh, a task? So, for example, the classification template is that there is a goal. So I want to uh, determine the class of an object, for example, a, a taxi. There are things for inspection, a car. Uh, the class is a group of items that share the similar items, like a taxi. An attribute is something that you can see or infer, like a color or an icon. And a feature is an attribute value pair, like a color is yellow. And you can find these templates uh, in a book called Knowledge Engineering and Manage, the Komakats Methodology. Uh, and if you look at online, you will find these templates in, in detail. So this is a, an example of a classification or a decision table to uh, determine uh, insects. So for example, how do you distinguish between a, a spider and a beetle? You can look at the number of legs, whether they have a stinger, number of eyes, if they have compound eyes, and whether they have wings. So this is a decision table. Uh, this is really helpful to talk with an expert to say, okay, is this how your knowledge is, is composed? And um, you can also know, uh, fairly easy uh, program this into your, to your software. The other one is diagnosis. The diagnosis starts with the engine doesn't work. And the difference between diagnosis is that you cannot immediately find a solution, but you have to test a number of hypotheses. So for example, the car mechanic has, has different possible faults uh, and uh, ideas what would be, be wrong. So you have uh, a hypothesis, I think this will be wrong, or the, 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 the fuel is empty, or the fuse is blown, or the battery is low. And then you say, okay, I need evidence or findings to see what's going on, and then explain why that's going on. So a fuse, if you want to see if a fuse is blown, you can see that there is a, uh, this, this cable is, is, is broken. So, and this is a, a way to implement a knowledge base. So there is a, a Python library called Durable. 
and then below you you will find the uh, if you look for Google on GitLab you will or GitHub you will find it. And basically, this is a rule set that uh, expl uh, gives the computer the, the way to reason why uh, the power state is off and why what reasons there are why an engine will not start because the the power is off or the gas level is uh, is empty. So, uh, and, I'll, uh, and to conclude my talk, I will give a, a number of uh, real-world examples to do with, uh, especially with uh, monitoring. Um, so the first one is to uh, maintain safety on the waterways. So in the Netherlands, we have a lot of water and a lot of traffic on the water. And the idea is that our mensa thing is a large construct that floats in the water. And they are actually actually travel signs and also navigational points. So you see a navigational map uh, chart in the, in the below, uh, and they indicate how uh, ships have to behave on the, the water. But the problem is these buoys are connected to uh, chains. Sometimes these chains get corroded, or a ship will uh, have an accident with the buoy. So uh, a lot of times these have to be inspected. And how do you do it? So there is a, a norm. So you expect, for example, based on a map where these buoys are, and you do a visual observation. You see, well, is it still there? And then you look for uh, for things that are off. So what you see here is all these uh, buoys. They're actually large uh, things. In the middle, you can see a map of uh, of a place in the Netherlands. It's called Rotterdam. Rotterdam is one of the biggest uh, harbors, and on the Right side, you see the, the map with all these colors and uh, the, the shapes of the buoys. So what we did, we uh, we put a, a small camera on the, on the ship. So on the left side, you can see the, the actual findings. So now it detects kind of yellow buoys. And on the right side, that's actually the norm, is a map indicating where the buoys uh, uh, should, should be. And what the system does, it constantly compares the map, what should be there, with the findings uh, on the left side, and then compare them: is this, uh, is this, uh, is this uh, are these actually there, and is it uh, correct? Another one is to uh, inspect uh, uh, road quality. The idea is that okay, we want to have a good and reliable uh, infrastructure. There are all kind of norms about uh, quality, so no potholes. Uh, the cars should be uh, able to drive over the road, um, and there are visual observations. So what you see on the right side, this is a small van with cameras on top of it. It's the same with how Google Street View works. They just have cars driving around with the cameras. And the task is to find out places to repair the road. So how does damaged roads look like? So this is really obvious. Uh, where the problems are, well, <laughs> and you can see a lot of uh, issues there. Um, uh, but before it goes there, you want to uh, to see signs where there's something is going wrong. So this is an example of, uh, of an image and what you see are uh, two or three cracks. And basically what happens here is that uh, a car drives and every five meter an image is uh, taken. And there is an expert who has to inspect all these images manually, which is really a time consuming uh, task. And what we did, we asked an expert, so okay, how do you see these cracks? And he explained as well, it's, it's a matter of of how the shadow falls. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is that you have to, what they call it, you have to read the road like a newspaper. So you don't have to inspect the whole picture. You only inspect the part that's between the, uh, the markings. Um, and you just start from the, the top left to the bottom right, and you look at all the small parts and you see if something is, uh, is off. The moment you find it, you'll find a problem. You will give a, a a classification about the type of uh, damage. Um, you can also do that with uh, markings, the same with buoys. If the markings are off, then you have to uh, uh, clean them. Uh, and you can also detect traffic signs and put the information on the geo view. Well, if the technology, so <clears throat> this out looks in, uh, in real, real time. Uh, actually, it goes much faster, but it's just to, to show that you know, the car is uh, driving around. Uh, the, the the window is moving between the markings, and it looks for uh, things that are that are off. Um, this is another one. This one looks for markings. Uh, the car drives, and it just 
tries to recognize all kind of markings and uh, says something about the type of road and uh, does an analysis about the quality of the of the markings. So to wrap up, um, human knowledge is about facts, concepts, and the procedures or skills, and uh, the way to acquire this data is that, that you say, okay, tell me more about it and check all the assumptions. Uh, if you want to build uh, explainable digital system with new knowledge, you can use this uh, cuts or lean cuts framework. So where you know what's the context, the mind model, the reasoning part, the ICT infrastructure, the AI infrastructure, and the explainable uh, model. You can use uh, a word spider web uh, just to to gather uh, to, to gather all this concept and put it in a data model based on the type of task, either it's classification, diagnosis, or monitoring. You can uh, find out what the kind of reason you know you have to need and find a, a, a knowledge presentation, for example, a decision table or a rule set. And our advice is to separate the ICT, which has to do with GUIs, devices, database, etc., with the, uh, the AI. Um, and as last, I gave a couple of examples uh, how you can automate immunity large tasks. So thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I really enjoyed it and I'm sure that the rest did as well. Um, yeah, so we have um, uh, really enough time for questions and uh, remarks. I uh, see already one question in the in the chat. So I will um, maybe, Anwar, do you want to pose it yourself or shall I read it out loud? Okay. Oh, I can, I can pose it uh, myself. I enjoyed the presentation. It's very nice, uh, let's say, uh, pre uh, yeah, exposure of uh, knowledge-based systems. Uh, so two, two aspects. One aspect is intuition and uh, uh, human can be intuitive. And so maybe part of this was explained, but maybe you can elaborate on this. And the other one is self-learning. So uh, how to build a self-learning system in order to avoid that the system becomes, uh, let's say, less, less up-to-date with the time. Yeah. If, so. Yeah, so so uh, the concept of intuition is actually what I try to explain about the the fast and the slow part yeah. of the memory. So when I ask you how much is one plus one, you would say, ah, it's two. Yeah. So you can call this intuition or it's automated. And um, most of the experts I have spoken, somehow they learn to do this. And of course, there is, you know, some, some knowledge you perhaps come from a genetically or from an evolutionary point of view. But mostly of the time, uh, what we call intuition is just automated. And the way to get it out of the expert is just to well, play stupid. <laughs> just, you know, just explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. And most of the time, well, mostly the first time we've talked to an expert, they, they just say, you know, how did you do this? Well, just, just, I just do it. I know it. I automate in intuition. And just later on, you can uh, challenge them to get this information out of it. For example, we're starting this, you know, just explain me your daughter. Like, why is this? Why? why? Why, 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 why? There's a lot of, of why questions, but mainly <clears throat> it, it takes some time before you understand the expert and also that the expert understands what you're actually trying yeah. to achieve. So the expert has to think about his own yeah. way of the reasoning. The other way about self-learning. So um, first of all, if you, if you talk to an expert and you think, okay, now I know what heuristics or what reasoning patterns is, it, it is, it is, it is applying. Then you build a system and then you're going to ask the expert, okay, so I, you know, you told me how your reasoning works. Now I put it in the system. Is this okay? And probably the expert will say, no, 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 you forgot these five things or there are still exceptions you, you, you don't know about it. So the, the first thing you want to do is that the system can explain why, why, the, why it came to, to a conclusion. And the self-learning part is that you just adjust or add uh, new examples. So, there is, well, there is this thing about, okay, if you only look at, you know, the work and the output, and then, you know, the system can figure out how it has been doing, like we see in, in, in data science or deep learning. And I think there can be a combination where you say, okay, I build a rule system, but for a lot of things, we just don't know it. You, you, you can apply it, but mostly the, the self-learning is more maintenance. Um, and, and even we have experts who we taught how to create or, uh, add or adjust a decision table or to to add rules yeah. but this is Thank still you. promising uh, to uh, to investigate of course 
Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, the, so the floor is uh, still open for, for questions from others. Yeah, I'll, I'll also ask a quick question. So, so you also, I think you explained it a little bit already, um, uh, but there's there's this interplay with an expert, right? And, and, and sort of yeah. trying to get this information or knowledge out of someone's head into, uh, into a system, and you have several ways of doing that. Um, so I was just wondering, is there, do you have any experience in, let's say, doing this in different contexts and how you might need to change your method of doing this? And I can, I can imagine that even just a geographical context uh, might require different types of methods, but I was just wondering if you have any thoughts or ideas on that. Yeah, well, the, the first part is that, that if you will talk to an expert, you, you have to be sure that the expert is at ease, that you don't say, okay, I will now talk two hours with you capture all knowledge and then you're fired <laughs> you know so the incentive would be that the expert so most of the system we have done is just to help the expert um, and then and we say what's well, something like augmented intelligence so we ask the expert okay probably 80 percent of your work is boring stuff because for you that's uh, routine work so if we put this 80% of routine work into a system, you can focus on the 20% part of the interesting stuff. And then the experts will say, oh yeah, yeah, I want to get rid of all this boring stuff. And then we will ask, okay, what for you, what is to be boring? And then, uh, so th this is more just set the settling why you're acquiring this knowledge. Uh, or uh, so what we say is some tasks are really large or, or boring for an expert. So that's the, would be the first phase to get the expert at ease. And of course, you have different kind of experts. So some of them will just not talk. They will say, okay, just ask me any question you want. Tell me about your domain. Yeah, what do you want to know? <laughs> so so they, you know, they are like closed one. Other, other, others will just start explaining a lot of stuff like academics. They will have a big grand theory about how everything works. And you have to ease them down. Oh, no, no, we, Let's start with, with a small one. And other ones are really pragmatic. So they... Uh, they are more like example based. We say, well, give, give give me a small example. Okay, you explain how you have, how this works and how would you uh, teach me this? So how how can I come there? And um, I think it is also important, and that that's why we we created this canvas that you uh, have the expert uh, thinking with you about the architecture. So that you say, okay, now I'm going to you know talk with you, and I think this is how your domain looks, and you you show you show the spider web. So the class diagrams are too, uh, are too complicated, but if you say, okay, this is a, a word spider web, which actually kids learn at grammar school, and this is correct, would, would you teach this to a five-year-old? And this is a way to, to level it a little bit down. But I think the, the most important thing is, is about uh, that you assume too much, so that you say, okay, I'm in this domain, and I, I, I also know something, uh, I also know something about it. So uh, as a uh, last example to conclude the answer is about uh, also about cars. And this is, so we worked for an insurance company and there was this term called damage. So if your car gets into an accident, you have damage, physical damage to the car. So something is broken or whatever. Um, but if you go to an insurance company, they also use the term damage, but this is not the damage to the car. What they call damage is the amount of money they have to pay. So they use this they use the same term, but in a different setting, and that's of course where the semantic web comes in. So, in, in, based on the context, terms have different meanings. Thanks, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, I see there's another question in the chat uh, by Maria Bovet. Um, Maria, I'm not sure if you want to ask the question yourself. Give you the opportunity to do that. Uh, well, I can, I can ask him, but I don't know if uh, he will take it. Uh, <laughs> But or I mean, well, I would like to ask you if uh, well, I'm I'm a pedagogy, I study pedagogy, so I don't know anything about artificial intelligence apart of this course. So, uh, do you think that a person that uh, yes, uh, learn by his or himself, uh, it's like a kid because I think that uh, yes, a kid, but uh, with with a lot of strength inside because well i i disagree with you in this part of self-learning self related to and i think that it's very um related to emotional learning and yeah 
Well, and a person that uh, builds his or her business, it's then like a kid because I mean. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, kids are much smarter than uh, machines. So machines are, are really lazy things. So that they, they have really big computer, computational power, big calculus, but they they, they lack the, the what kids have is something like play or curiosity. So if if I if I would give a pie to a computer, say, look, like let's eat a pie and play around with the divine the computer, <laughs> won't do anything. So I think that that's something computers don't have and kids kids have. The other thing about more like emotional learning is that well, if if you want to learn somebody, you have something like reinforcement. So if somebody is doing right, say, yeah, you're doing a, a good thing. And if something wrong, you say, ah, that's not good. Or even if, if punishment, so you have positive and negative uh, reinforcement, which you see from the learn theory. And basically, the the idea about reinforcement learning is one of the parts of machine learning, that the machine is is trying to figure something out, and you give feedback. It's good or it's bad, and then the machine will will change it. In the part of uh, knowledge engineering, where we say, okay, we're not going to look at a lot of examples. We're just trying to figure out how somebody, what pattern is somebody using in his head to figure this out. And what you also want to look for is the uh, exam, uh, exceptions you not only always find in the, in the, in the in data. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think maybe. Oh, oh, sorry. I wanted also to ask a question uh, regarding the, the topic. Uh, I was actually curious because you said uh, you are working. The company was uh, started in 1985, right? Yeah. And this whole time you've always been working uh, uh, regarding AI. So you haven't worked in IT. How was it developing an artificial system back in that day? Because uh, currently, from my experience, most of the knowledge we gained was like in the last 10 years. Uh, the reinforcement, reinforcement learning, the deep neural networks, and all of the AI uh, development. So, uh, <clears throat> when I was taught AI, they said, well, okay. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I, my Zoom crashed for some reason. Uh, so, yeah, so what I would say, uh, the, all the development was done in the latest years. So, what, what was it like back in the day? Uh, if you have any experience, of course. Uh, well, what, when I was on, on, in the AI school, they actually said, well, you only do machine learning if you don't understand the domain, like a last resort. So next to that, you have case-based reasoning, uh, uh, knowledge engineering, etc." But I think the, the big difference with now is that, well, the old days, well, Hans is actually can tell you more about this than I, is that um, the, the, the compute, uh, computational uh, power was much less. And also there was, much less data available. So if you look now, for example, if you want to do image training of Coke or whatever, and all this, so there's a lot of data available, a lot of computational power. And also then most of the expert systems were standalone system. There were a separate machine doing all this, uh, this reasoning. But what we see now is that uh, although machine learning is, you know, is really, really good in, uh, uh, domains, for example, by, by doing a classification, recognize, recognizing objects, but still, uh, if you uh, apply it uh, uh, to other domains, you see that there, also, there are some errors and there are a lot of examples where it works fine on a train set, but then it's, it, it gets a lot of noise in it and then the system just doesn't know what it is. So there's an example, I think it's even a meme on the internet. So there's a machine that can recognize animals and there is a cat sitting in a box and then everybody can see it's a cat, but the system says, ah, it's probably a snail because that's that's how, how it looks like so um in my experience and also to uh, give an explanation at the end why the system came with a decision uh, i prefer to make rules or even mixed systems so most of our system are actually hybrid systems so for example with the boost the, the recognition of the boost that's done with machine learning because they, they are just easier to do it but the excellent reasoning with the map that's done with uh, with rules I think this also relates to the question that is in the chat by Ping Tan, who says, uh, it seems like uh, now there's this, uh, you know, the, the hype is going to uh, more, more statistical methods, more, uh, uh, let's say, neural networks based methods. Uh, and they seem to be outperforming knowledge based systems, uh, at, at least in some tasks. Uh, and then 
here she says, I'm a believer of human experts, but what is your opinion on the current knowledge-based approach of extracting knowledge from experts and how does it need to be changed? So I think the question here is, yeah, what do you think in this, let's say, changing landscape where the statistical methods are seeming to be the, you know, the party on top and you're yeah. still working on knowledge-based systems. So maybe you can reflect a bit on that. Yeah, <clears throat> so there is a, I, I don't remember the name of, of uh, but there's a, an Oxford professor who makes uh, chess uh, puzzles where all these uh, chess machines don't know the uh, solution to. So actually, they, they make this, if your human looks at this chess problem, you would say, okay, this is, this is you can never solve this. Uh, but the computers, they just thought, oh, okay, I'm going to bridge 25, and they, and they try to, and they actually they lose there because they lack the insights that there are. There are. And also, uh, uh, a lot of uh, real world problems are not bringing back to the, the, the chess, uh, chess part. But I think that, um, the nice thing is that we, and also at Bolivia, we, make, we build hybrid systems. So based on the uh, type of task, we just figure out what would, would be the, the best solution. So a lot of classification just to recognize things. The machine learning is re really promising. But for example, for diagnosis, where you have uh, different reasoning parts to get to the solution, like if you go to a doctor, they just start to hypothesize. So I think this is, well, let's first go there, let's go there. And that are the rule-based approach is, uh, I think, a much better approach to do it. And in the end, you want to understand. So if a system will say, okay, we have to cut off your leg, you want to understand why it is. And if you could say, yeah, sorry, the, statistically speaking, this is the best way to do it. You perhaps want to be to have a little bit more explanation, like, you know, there's corona in your leg, whatever, and, you know, blah, 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 this is the best way to do it. But you have an, an, an expert explanation why this is the best uh, solution to it. So if you want to go to explainable AI, uh, and also from an ethical point of view, that you understand why the system came to a solution or decision, um, that would be in favor for the, the knowledge one. But I think the hybrid approach is the best one. Great, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, yeah, I think this is also a nice segue into the, to the, the, the talk uh, that we'll have after the break by Frank, because I think I'm not, I haven't seen the talk yet, but I guess it's more data driven and uh, more, let's say, leaning towards uh, machine learning. So I hope that you keep in mind uh, Chris's uh, suggestion for these hybrid systems and how they can collaborate.